study discovers cellular activity that hints recycling is in our DNA. This is according to Ross uh, Michia, University of California, Santa Cruz. Although you may not appreciate them or have even heard of them, throughout your body, countless microscopic machines called spliceosomes are hard at work. And as you sit and read, they are faithfully, rapidly putting back together the broken information in your genes by removing sequences called introns, quote-unquote, I-N-T-R-O-N-S, so that your messenger RNAs can make the correct proteins needed by your cells. Introns are perhaps one of our genome's biggest mysteries. They are DNA sequences that interrupt the sensible protein-coded information in your genes and need to be spliced out. The human genome has hundreds of thousands of introns, about seven or eight per gene, and each is removed by a specialized RNA protein complex called the spliceosome that cuts out all the introns and splices together the remaining coding sequences called exons, E-X-O-N-S. How the system of broken genes and the spliceosome evolved in our genome is not known. Over the long, his long career, Manny Aris, UC uh, Santa Cruz Distinguished Professor of Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology, has made it his mission to learn as much about RNA splicing as he can. He said, I'm all about the spliceosome. I just want to know everything the spliceosome does, even if I don't know why it is doing it. In a new paper published in the journal Genes and Development, Aris reports on a surprising discovery about the spliceosome that could tell us more about the evolution of different species and the way cells have adapted to the strange problem of introns. The authors show that after the spliceosome is finished splicing the mRNA, it remains active and can engage in further reactions with the removing, removed introns. This discovery provides the strongest indication we have so far that spliceosomes could be able to reinsert an intron back into the genome in another location. This is an ability that spliceosomes were not previously believed to possess, but which is a common characteristic of group 2 introns, distant cousins of the spliceosomes that exist primarily in bacteria. The spliceosome and group 2 introns are believed to share a common ancestor that was responsible for spreading introns throughout the genome, but while group 2 introns can splice themselves out of RNA and then directly back into DNA, the spliceosomal introns that are found in most higher level organisms require the spliceosome for splicing and were not believed to be reinserted back into the DNA. However, Aris's lab finding indicates that the spliceosome might still be reinserted, intro, inserting introns into the genome today. This is an intriguing possibility to consider because introns that are reintroduced into DNA add complexity to the genome. And understanding more about where these introns come from could help us be, to understand better, better understand how organisms continue to evolve. Building on an interesting discovery, an organism's genes are made of DNA in which four bases adenine is A, cystosine C, guanine G, and thymine T are ordered in sequences that code for biological instructions like how to make specific proteins in the body, the body needs. Before these instructions can be read, the DNA gets copied into RNA by a process known as transcription, and then the introns in that RNA have to be removed before a ribosome can translate it into actual proteins. The spliceosome removes introns using a two-step process that results in the intron RNA having one of its ends joined to its middle, forming a circle with a tail that looks like a cowboy's uh, lasso. And this appearance has led to them being named uh, lasso is a lariat, lariat introns. Recently, researchers at Brown University who are studying the locations of the joining sites in these lariats made an odd observation. Some introns were actually circular instead of lariat-shaped. This observation immediately got Aris' attention. 
something seemed to be interacting with the lariat introns after they were removed from the RNA sequence to change their shape and the spliceosome was his main suspect. He said, I thought that was interesting because of this old, old idea about where introns came from, Aris said. There's a lot of evidence that the RNA parts of the spliceosome, the SNRNAs, are closely related to a group 2 introns. And because the chemical mechanism for splicing is very similar between the spliceosomes and our distant cousins, the group 2 introns, many researchers have theorized, that when the process of cell splicing becomes too insufficient for group 2 introns to reliably complete on their own, Parts of these introns evolved to become the spliceosomes. While group 2 introns were able to insert themselves directly back into DNA, however, spliceosomal introns that required the help of spliceosomes were not thought to be inserted back into DNA. One of the questions that was sort of missing from this story in my mind was, as it pos is it possible that the modern spliceosome is still able to take a lariat intron and insert it somewhere in the genome, Aris said. Is it still capable of doing what the ancestor complex did? To begin to answer this question, Aris decided to investigate whether it was indeed the spliceosome that was making changes to the lariat introns to remove their tails his labs showed, slowed the slicing process in yeast cells and discovered that after the spliceosome in, re, released the mRNA that it had finished splicing introns from, it hung onto intron lariats and reshaped them into the true circles. The Aris lab was able to re analyze the published RNA sequence data from human cells and found that human spliceosomes also had this ability. He said, we're excited about this because we don't know what this circular RNA might do. The fact that the spliceosome still active, is still active suggests that it may be able to catalyze the insertion of the lariant intron back into the genome, Aris said. If the spliceosome is able to reinsert the intron into DNA, this would also add significant weight to the theory that spliceosomes and group 2 introns shared a common ancestor long ago and testing their theory. Now that Aris and his lab have shown that the spliceosome has a catalytic, catalytic ability to hypothetically place introns back into DNA like their ancestors did, the next step is for the researchers to create an artificial situation in which they feed a DNA strand to a spliceosome that is still attached to the lariat intron and see if they can actually get it to insert the intron somewhere which would present proof of concept for this theory. If the spliceosome is able to reinsert introns into the genome, it is likely to be a very infrequent event in humans because the human spliceosomes are in incredibly high demand and therefore do not have much time to spend with removed introns. In other organisms where the spliceosome is not as busy, however, the reinsertion of introns may be more frequent Aris is working closely with UCSC biomolecular engineering professor Russ Corbett Dettig, who has recently led a systematic and exhaustive hunt for new introns in the available genomes of all intron containing species that was published in the journal Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, last year. The paper in PNAS showed that intron burst events far back in evolutionary history has likely introduced thousands of introns into a genome all at once. Aries and Corbett Detting are now working on recreate to recreate a burst event artificially, which would give them insight into how genomes reacted when, when this happened. Aries said that his cross-disciplinary partnership with Corbett Detting has opened the doors for them to really dig into some of the biggest mysteries about introns that would probably be impossible for them to understand fully without their combined expertise. It's the best way to do things, Ara said. He said, when you find someone who has the same kind of questions in mind, but a different set of methods, perspectives, biases, and weird ideas, that gets more exciting. That makes you feel like you can break out and solve a problem like this, which is very complex. 
I wonder if this is way, a way that some animals regrow their uh, appendages as well, like tails or hands or whatever, like in salamanders or snakes or worms. Very interesting. This is by University of California, Santa Cruz. Manuel Ares and colleagues on phys.org. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support. I really support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.